We're back with Season 7, Episode 15, Triple Threat. This is the episode in which Spike and Twilight and Starlight all grab the idiot ball and hold on to it for dear life as Ember and Thorax show up being like, hey, what's up? And we play Three's Company for a little bit until we actually get to the episode. <laughs> Oh my god. I know I said I needed positivity this today, and god I do, but I don't think this is it. <laughs> maybe next episode, maybe next episode. I actually don't have that many notes here, although I will be bringing up some of the topics I brought up earlier, because of course I will, that's how MLP tends to work. The first thing I want to bring up is Twilight tells Spike to chill about organizing. Just picture that for a second. I'm sure they did that on purpose. Spike then, of course, has also written down a list of all of the things that he has a reason to freak out over. Yeah, <laughs> that tracks. That makes sense to me. So then Thorax shows up, and so, okay, they're all surprised by Thorax being there, which... <sighs> well, yeah, Lieutenant Leroy. I mean, remember when he was competing against an owl? Anyways, so Thorax is like, Hi, I'm here. First of all, can I just say that Spike is a terrible friend? I shouldn't say it that way. Spike is not a good friend. Because I've seen this happen in real life from real people where they're like, Hey, let's do this thing. And then they completely space. It's not really malevolence. You know, there's no ill intent or cruelty involved. It's just they didn't think about it or they didn't remember it or they were busy and that always sucks doesn't it still every time that's happened to me i have always preferred that they tell me that especially when i bug them about it rather than them trying to lie or make up for it. like oh no i totally had something planned because i've had people do that to me too girlfriends included thank you oculus very much if you happen to know where you want to put that please let me know and thank you as always. <laughs> um, so, okay. So, Spike forgetting, it is understandable. It sucks, but it is understandable. The fact that he actually invited the two of them on the same day is a little bit less understandable. One of the few traits Spike has demonstrably shown several times is that he's good at organizing. Now, granted, he's usually organizing for someone else. He's a good lieutenant for Twilight. We, we've actually shown that several times. Or First Officer, as we out said. I know, Oculus. I don't... What do you want from me? <laughs> you want me to manually sit down and type that out? Because I could. It would take me a day and a half. <laughs> Look, pick a video game. It's probably on the list or on the rejected list. Or can be added to the list. Just pick a game. Hmm. <clears throat> So Spike, the fact that Spike, let me just, the reason I'm emphasizing this point is this, this is important. The fact that Spike has failed at this organizational level and forgotten that he organized both things at the same day is, let's call that combined strike one. Strike two is when we get to about the three minute mark. Read a sure thing, Oculus. Hang on, everyone. I need to read Oculus's options out loud, the entire list. <clears throat> no, uh, so the second strike is at the three minute mark. He says, no, we can't let them interact with each other because they'd never be friends. Okay, first of all, that's stupid and presumptive. But it also, whew, excuse me, it's also really, really stupid because it's, it, it's doing something that's bad, like demonstrably bad. I'll talk about that in a moment, so don't let me forget about talking about that. And the third strike comes up immediately afterwards, because immediately in the wake of this, both Twilight and Starlight agree with his assessment. Oh yeah, they'd never get along. We need to total. So strike three happens at about the three minute and 40 second mark, give or take. So this is an idiot ball episode. It doesn't let it go, I wrote down the time. It doesn't let go of the idiot ball until... Uh, the 16-minute mark. And it's 
actually aggravating. Now, allow me to talk about the idiot ball for a second as a concept, if that's okay. So the idiot ball, by definition, is when someone is acting stupid out of character. That's what that means. Uh, all of the b various balls... Dabla 3, you got it, Alkus. And no, you're not. In fact, if you give me one, I can tell you how many people are donating to Diablo 3, because that's not going to take me 17 hours. Uh, uh, there are four people who've donated towards Diablo 4, including you, Mr. Red, Kira White Noise, and Gold Tech. Idiot ball, all the balls when it comes to narrative tropes, are situations where the person is acting in a way that is bad writing. They're acting out of character, or they're acting inconsistent, or they're acting in a way that only exists for the sake of drama, or for the sake of because plot, you know, the plot ball, the idiot ball, the drama ball, all of these are the same general concept, being completely out of character for the sake of a reason that doesn't really work. That being said... There are extremely rare cases where picking up the blank ball isn't necessarily a bad thing because it goes towards good effect, right? I don't think we've had an example of that in MLP, but I have seen that before. The problem is they they pick up the idiot ball, already a problem. Actually, that's not a bad example. Admiral de Gaulle is a good example of the idiot ball doing something decent with it. Now, this is different from the cloud effect, because cloud effect is about premises, you know. Um, flapjacks invade the earth. That's stupid. Now imagine it, it's a really, really awesome movie. That's cloud effect, right? Uh, no, this is the case of someone somehow miraculously turning a stupid trope and making something good out of it. And Admiral de Gaulle from StarCraft Brood War is a good example of that. Because Admiral de Gaulle picks up the idiot ball hard. I'm not going to spoil, but I'll give you a, a non-spoiler version of this. He takes the word of some brand new person he has demonstrably stated that he doesn't trust and believes them over his longtime friend who is a, 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 a not just a personal friend but a professional friend who is his second in command and in so doing orders the second in command's killing and that's stupid like it's it's face palmingly stupid he picks up the idiot ball hard but as a result of that we get some really good stuff we get Admiral de Gaulle's overall character arc. Stukov gets his moment, his final moments, and of course he shows up in the second game. And we get the reveal and turnaround of what exactly uh, uh, Duran or Narud is doing this whole time. So there's good result out of that. But again, that is rare. <laughs> so coming back to my point, the idiot ball is still bad. And when I review StarCraft 1, I do intend to give a negative for the idiot ball. But then if you do an idiot ball on top of something else, that's also true, Dream Whisper. There's, it's very likely Dugal was being mentally influenced by Narud, because that's how Narud operates. But, um, but the idiot ball's already bad, but then if the idiot ball leads to something also bad, that is another separate negative. So what does the idiot ball lead to in this case? Three's company! It leads to sitcom shenanigans. I don't know what else to call it. A bunch of stupid... Oh no, they might see each other. Woo, boo, 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 crap, which I don't like in general and isn't particularly entertaining on any level. Not intellectually, not informatively, not emotionally, not viscerally, not humorly. It's just... And so for the first 15 minutes or so, there are moments, spikes, if you will, of decency. But for the most part, this is not just boring, it's actually bad. And I'm, I'm emphasizing all this now because I just want to get all that out in one big bundle. Because we're going to talk about the rest of it, but the rest of it is intermittent, right? So there's just like this, this, this pancake batter that hasn't cooked properly that's smeared across the episode, and that sucks. But then there's the occasional, like, oh, there's a strawberry with some whipped cream on it. So let's talk about some strawberries and whipped cream. First of all, um, let's, actually, I'm sorry. Nope. I got to mention one more thing. Hang on. One of the key points, strike two, if you'll remember, is these two won't be friends. They're too different from each other. And that's their reasoning. I want to remind you that one of the strongest friendships amongst the main six is Applejack and Rarity. A friendship that was established on camera and developed on camera. I should also point out the fact that there have been entire episodes pointing out that just because they're different doesn't mean they're not friends. I believe we had one semi-recently with uh, Maud, for example. 
Yeah. Oh, no. I'm sorry, that was that was earlier. We had one recently with Discord and Fluttershy. You're right, because that was just a few weeks ago. Yeah. Anyways. <clears throat> this is, to bring up one other thing here. I also have semi-recently discussed how lying makes things worse, right? I had a whole discussion about that. About how, you know, if, if you do something bad, that sucks. But it, then if you lie about it, that magnifies it. It's a factor at that point. It multiplies the bad into worse. There's a scene later on, which I'm going to jump ahead of my notes, where Spike actually owns up to this to both of them. And their reaction is, and I wrote this down word for word, although it's not hard to remember. So what? And that's their reaction. Now, this is, of course, being exaggerated for the sake of the episode, but the point is, him lying about it is the problem of the episode. Anyways. So, Ember shows up. Uh, actually, hang on, really quick. I have to talk about how Thorax is super attracted to the flame. That that actually got a legitimate... Like I said, there's spikes of decency amongst us. That's why I wanted to get the pancake batter out of the way first. Thorax being attracted to the flame, and he walks away with, with Twilight. It's like, okay, cool. And then Ember shows up. It's like, oh. And they're like, whew. And yeah, Ember's pretty legit, uh, pretty much the whole episode. And of course, she looks at Starlight and says, hey, Twilight. Yeah. Also, Starlight automatically likes Ember. Yeah. <laughs> now, we'll talk more about the, the Starlight gag in a second. The next thing that happens is Spike, who is a dragon who likes eating gems, decides to take her to a banquet uh, in, in a gem room. And apparently it didn't occur to him for five seconds that this might be a bad idea. Now, this is stupid for several reasons. First of all, Spike probably uh, knows that he likes eating gems. I, I have a feeling he might be aware of his own uh, food, food uh, propensities. Second of all, he could just tell her, no, those aren't for eating. I have gems for eating, because he probably does, and then he could bring out gems for eating. This is, again, the lying thing, because we got a threes company, because sitcom. And she would totally be cool with that, because, oh, okay, sorry. In fact, she'd probably be embarrassed about it and take a moment to recover, like, oh, yep, yeah, okay. Which leads me to one Max Stone. I was going to mention what S.A. Ross just brought up in chat. I have a feeling that Spike has at least tried to bite the walls or, or the room or whatever at least once. You can't tell me in the last, what's it been, three years now or however long it's supposed to be in universe, that he hasn't tried to eat the walls at least once. <clears throat> so, this then cuts to... Hey, Mr. Red, I thought you were gone for good. Um, this then cuts to uh, Twilight doing the chairs thing. Now, obviously this is being done because we're continuing the Threes Company gag, but a thought bounced in the back of my head while I was watching this. How many of you have ever played, um, you know, Game Boy, PSP, DS, 3DS, Switch? Anybody? Handheld game? I'm not going to mention phones, but, you know, anybody? How many of you have a preferred position to sit or rest in while doing so? And the reason I bring that up is because I used to specifically have a specific spot, and a, a spot on a couch, actually, and that was my preferred spot for playing handheld. And I just it, it just bounced around in my head, because if I had the power and money to do so, because I absolutely do not right now, because I have... I own a single chair. You're looking at it. Um, but if I had the capacity, I would totally have, like, a chair for, you know, reading, and I'd have a chair for playing games, and I'd have a chair for watching stuff, you know? That there's an understandability there, because you want different things depending on what you're going for. Of course, this is all being played for laughs, which is a shame, because it makes it sound like it's, you know, a lie, but... I could see Twilight actually having multiple chairs for this kind of thing. At the eight-minute mark, the, the idiot ball continues. I want to mention that uh, Twilight and Starlight are both fully in favor of this Threes Company plan. This is when the map calls Spike. Okay, so in the interests of reality, or in the interest of fairness, excuse me, we should mention the fact that Spike was still involved with the map when the map was getting rejiggered, right? Spike was going back through and time traveling along with Twilight, 
So Spike and the Six and Starlight are pretty much officially all of the people. Uh, yes, I did know that trick over here. <laughs> are pretty much all of the people uh, who are connected to the map in the modern sense. There's also other people who probably be connected to it in the past sense. But the point being, we've kind of run out of the list of people who could be called by the map, and it's not really significant yet. That being said, the map is clearly still branching out, which is interesting in its own right. I will also mention that the friendship problem presented in this episode is exactly the type of issue that the map would call someone to, so that that's on task. That then leads to the most terrifying thought of the entire episode. Vanilla strawberry cream is overused. Interesting music choice. You ever wonder if the castle regenerates? I've actually theorized before that crystals grow in this setting, and I've talked about that before. I wonder if the crystals in the castle grow. This then cuts over to Spike, who is just finishing talking with Lyra and Bon Bon. And he says, and that's why you should never let cupcake uh, cupcake flavors get in the way of your friendship. Now, I want to laugh about that. How many of you have ever seen people stop being friends or pals or have disagreements or break up over similarly mundane things? Now, if we're being completely honest, it should be mentioned that, especially in the case of romantic relationships, if they're breaking up over cupcake flavors, that's probably not why they're breaking up. That hap That's just the latest incident. But the fact remains, I have seen this stuff happen before. Yeah, exactly, Imperial Star Destroyer. Also, I agree with that ogre. Load the damn dishwasher correctly. The episode goes out of its way to show that Ember and Thorax both feel upset because both notice that Spike is obviously dismissing both of them. It's almost like he's being a dick. And we all know what I think about Rule Zero Violators. Real quick side note. As he's ta Thorax is talking to Spike, two things. First, we have a bit of foreshadowing. There's this renegade group of changelings, and he talks about his brother, and yada yada yada. Foreshadowing, foreshadowing. The second thing... <laughs> Once again, we literally brought this up today, the difference between saying and doing. Thorax is doing a lot of saying and not a lot of doing with regards to his leadership style. In fact, that's basically his arc, his, his character thing, which will also be coming up in a future episode. And it's something that Ember helps him out with. So... <laughs> I'm not going to rehash all the Active Blizzard stuff, but again, saying, not doing. And the third point, because I just realized there's actually a third point here. How many of you think Spike was actually listening to any of that? Now, there's some inconsistent information here, because it pulls the whole time passes joke. Joke. And it, it shows that he's all nervous and worried. So it could be he's taking it in, or it could be he's completely ignoring him. That's up to you. But based on what I'm seeing, it feels like Spike is effectively just kind of smiling and nodding while Thorax is pouring his heart out to his first and possibly only friend. Uh, so... Then... The two meet. This is kind of interesting. Actually, I'm sorry. No, what? Act before we get to the two meeting, Ember uh, walks up and Starlight's, Hi, what's up? And Ember says, What are you talking about? You've been with me the whole time. You two look and act so alike. And the two immediately get pissed off about it. I mean, you're both purple ponies with purple hair, and you both have cutie marks with sparkly things. I will admit that got a genuine laugh out of me. Make of it what you will. I'm pretty sure that's at least partially trying to, you know, uh, make fun of the people who say they're the same and blah, blah, blah. But it, it did get a laugh out of me, and it's the only laugh the entire episode got out of me. This leads to an interesting scene. Ember gets pissed, which leads to, th to her yelling at Spike. Now, they happen to be like 10 feet from Thorax, and Thor so Thorax immediately lunges to the defense of Spike. 
Now, I guarantee the episode didn't do this on purpose, so it doesn't get points for this. But one of the interesting aspects of this exact moment is that despite being upset at them, because both of them are upset at Spike at this moment, both of them immediately are willing to fight a dangerous foe in order to defend him. Now, again, I don't give the episode credit for that point, but that is something I've talked about before and something MLP itself has covered before. There's your friends, and then there's the people who have your back when the chips are down, right? And the two don't necessarily coincide. Someone being willing to go to bat for you, even while currently being upset at you, does say a lot about how much they value their, his friendship, which is interesting because apparently he doesn't value theirs in return. So their response to this is, of course, so what? And they are both hurt by his presumption they wouldn't like each other. This is, yeah, exactly, I said, this is when we, the episode finally, at the 16 minute, actually, excuse me, at the 17 minute mark, this is when the episode finally drifts out of being absolutely terrible and starts dipping into something decent. It's the nicest phrase I can give this episode. Thorax and Ember just act off of each other for an entire scene. And it's actually a good scene. First of all, she helps him with regards to learning. And, and, and the two bounce off of each other beautifully, despite being substantially different personally, in terms of the personalities, culturally, in terms of how they were grew up and where they're from, and in terms of literal species. And the episode doesn't diminish that. It makes it clear that they're from two different worlds and they just happen to be interacting well. And it's good. It's good interaction. She then teaches him about decisiveness. And this is something that is important when it comes to leadership. Uh, forgive me for bringing Trek in as I always do, but in the episode Attached over in Season 7 of TNG, there's this bit where Crusher who is currently mentally connected to Picard, small spoilers, finds out that Picard has a thing he's been automatically doing for decades at that point, where once he makes a decision, he commits to it and acts like he knows what he's doing, even if he's uncertain or doesn't know what he's doing. Now, this could be argued in several directions, but that I, I personally do firmly believe that is an important trait for a leader to have. Because you don't always know what you're doing. And because you do take gambles and you do take risks when it comes to leadership decisions. Anybody who's ever watched me do a strategy game will hear me say the words, do I gamble or not? It's actually one of the most common phrases I say when it comes to tactical games, like when I'm playing XCOM or whatever, right? Because I, I'm looking at the situation and I know this strategy I'm about to employ is a gamble. Do I gamble or not? But you don't tell your troops do I gamble or not? You don't say, well, this might not work out. You say, I need you to go over here and I need you to do this immediately. And that's going to cover this flank for these other people. Get to it. That's how you lead a person. So she is right about that. Then. Yeah, exactly. We are. So you get it. You get it. Then we cover, cut over to his side of the argument, because she says, what do you do when you're arguing? Well, I prove that I'm awesome and amazing, and I beat the crap out of him, and then he's like, well, how do you think they feel about that? Well, they probably feel really crap. Oh, wow. <laughs> because once again, this is all about communication. He starts pointing out how you do need to communicate with people, even if you would disagree with them, or even if you're feeling a particular way about them. And then he says something that I'm sorry, by itself, this is pull, probably going to pull this episode out of blue territory for me. Because he hits the nail on the head so hard here. And I quote, You don't have to be sappy or huggy-feely about it, but you should let your friends know how you feel. I cannot tell you how many people I have known over my long... I shouldn't say long life. Over my short life. <laughs> who think that who think that the only way to be communicative, to be open about your feelings, to express how you feel, is to be lovey or huggy, so they don't. Both genders, by the way. Although I do see this a lot in guys. Um, I I can point to my currently still living grandfather, my only surviving grandfather right now. He has refused to be emotional, to say how he feels around his family, including me, for my entire life because he has this mentality. But again, as Thorax says, you don't have to be huggy-feely. And this ties in 
again to what I've talked about earlier. We keep tying in lore week topics into MLP. Being a decent human being doesn't, <laughs> damn it, Valerian, doesn't mean uh, you know the Zoe Chanel thing, right? You don't have to jump around and be like, yeah, this is amazing. But, no, 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 no. You can do that if you want to. No judgment. But just being a decent human being doesn't involve going that far and being emo emotional, being communicative, being open and expressing yourself does not mean hugging and talking over a bonfire while banging on a drum and being all lovey-dovey. Now, there's no judgment if you want to be lovey-dovey, but you don't have to. Well, you said that pretty much immediately after I said, no judgment if you want to stop supporting me. Because I was going to keep covering Blizzard stuff, Mr. Red. Literally, it was like 30 seconds after I said that. You were like, I have to go. Goodbye, everyone. So, I pay attention to contact clues. It's really irritating, because Ember and Thorax are easily the stars of this show. Uh, this episode, I should clarify. Um, the, the scenes with them are the best scenes, and it's such a shame that the spike garbage absolutely drag The pancake batter is just mucking up the first two-thirds of the episode. So this then leads to Ember and Thorax confronting Spike. Ember has to literally stretch before she expresses her feelings. I'm not making fun. That's awesome. And then, you know, Thorax pulls into her hug, and her response is, again, speaking of which, I have to give a continuity point for the hugging. Like, that this absolutely counts. <sighs> this then leads to, just because the episode, you know, finally starts... Where's my freaking... Here it is. The episode finally starts turning into something that might be considered a decent episode, and then Spike, at the last second, snatches it away. Snatches it away. I solved a friendship problem. No, you didn't. You caused a friendship problem. They solved the friendship problem. However, even while I was typing that note up, it got me thinking. Because that's interesting to think about, isn't it? This, the map doesn't send you to solve a friendship problem. It's... I'm saying that wrong. I'm saying that wrong. The goal of the map is not you solving the friendship problem. The goal of the map is the friendship problem being solved, which is a distinction that matters. Now, generally speaking, the map is going to call upon someone because they need to be involved. I keep calling it the GM because it effectively is. It's connected to the pattern, for lack of a better way to put it, in such a way that it can look at that and, yeah, it knows. It's like, oh, okay. And so Spike was being called on this one, summoned Spike to begin with, so that Spike would be aware of this situation and that he was involved in it. Spike then failed and flummoxed. And this, of course, leads to the, the friendship problem being resolved. If I'm being completely honest, if I was the mainliner for My Little Pony, ignoring the obvious stuff I would insist on rewriting for this episode, I would probably adjust how the map is used here, because it's very easy to interpret it like the map doesn't know what it's doing that it was raising a flag so that Spike would be aware, but Spike doesn't become aware, and that's the problem, because the map is supposed to know. It sends you because you're the right person for the right location. That's how it's been consistently up until this moment in time. It doesn't send Starlight and Twilight to deal with the princesses. It sends Starlight, right? I would have changed it around a little bit so that Maybe, so if, if you had to keep the bones of the episode, because I don't like to criticize without critiquing, I would probably do a thing where Spike is still nervous, is, is still worried. Let's remove Starlight and, and Twilight from the problem and just get rid of their complacency on that, or complicitness, complicitness on that. Make it so that Spike is freaking out, and then the map calls him, and then Spike's like, oh god, oh god, and as he's running around worrying about it, he sees Thorax, who's... Mo you know, just moping, waiting for him. And over there, he sees Ember, who's looking impatient, waiting for him. And there's like a light bulb moment. And I would also move this forward a bit, instead of being like at the 16 minute mark, it'd be like over here. As he realizes that he has caused the friendship problem, he then reaches out to them. They interact. More of these two interacting. Focus more on that emphasis on it. And then Shazam. 
Spike has now was actually the correct person for the job because in so being acknowledged, he realized the problem that he himself was causing unknowingly and now he is making effort to fix it, yada yada yada, right? And I think that would smooth over a lot of the issues of this episode. It, it would, there, there would be some rewrites, is what I'm trying to say. <sighs> Instead, this episode sucks. Oh, and it ends on a wah-wah. Because the episode ends on a wah-wah. Because of course it does. Uh, where's my notes? Here they are. Gotta have that wah-wah. Wah-wah. So how do we rate this thing? This is by Josh Hamilton, who wrote Parental Glidance, which is an episode I didn't like. If you remember, Parental Glidance was an episode in which Rainbow Dash was written in a certain way, and then the writer stepped in and insisted that she was completely wrong, despite the fact that she was demonstrably right. And then the episode got preachy. That author wrote this one. I'm willing to push it up to green from blue because of the thorax and the ember bits. Because thorax and ember are actually pretty awesome in the episode, and most of the times they're on on screen, they're good. And when the two actually interact in the final, final bit of the episode, the final fourth of the episode, that's actually good. That's my thoughts. What do you, I'm seeing some... Larian wants it blue. I mean, Larian didn't even finish the episode, so I don't blame you on that. By the way, do not let me forget to talk about kids' shows next episode. I don't want to talk about it this episode, because this is a bad time to talk about it. But next episode, I do want to talk about kids' shows. Cyan. <laughs> I mean, if people want to push down to blue, I'm not really going to argue that. We do have colors below blue, after all. Turquoise. I don't remember what next week's are. What is next week? the list. Uh, to change a changeling and Daring Dunn. I don't remember Daring Dunn. I do remember to change a changeling because Ferex, yeah. Or Phalanx, or whatever his name is. The guy we just referenced in this episode. Not very long, Mr. Red. I do have two other videos to work on and by two I mean two categories because I need to finish the theater but other than that once I am done with everything I'm, I might take a day just to myself just to mentally degauze but either way I'm going to get right back into streaming <sighs> yeah I'm, I'm okay with green which means Josh Hamilton has pushed out two green episodes what's funny is that? No, not yet. I asked him to have it to me by today. We'll see if he manages that. What's funny about this is Parental Glidance was also an episode that should have been blue, except they did enough good to push it up to green. Sound familiar? <laughs> uh, anyways. But it's okay. Next is an episode I have, like, no memories of. Everybody's telling me the next episode, which is Campfire Tales, is the next one we're covering, is a good episode. I have, like, no memories of this whatsoever, so I'm walking into this pretty blind. So we'll see what we think of this in about 25 minutes. 